So today we are very pleased to have uh, Anna Lardis join us. She was with us for our marriage retreat yesterday, she gave a very interesting lecture. And today she will give us a lecture entitled, Being an Orthodox Woman in the 21st Century. That does not mean that all the men have to leave. But we do hope that uh, we will have an opportunity to listen to her lecture, and also there will be an opportunity afterwards to have questions. Now, Matushke doesn't have a loud, obnoxious voice like I do, so we'll ask that you please try to keep the side conversations to a minimum, and that if the children are really noisy, that the parents help them to, to kind of moderate that. So without further ado, uh, and people can move forward by the way, kind of everybody walked away as soon as I began to talk, so please feel free to move forward. Uh, and without further ado, we welcome uh, Matushka Anna Lourdes to be with us today. Bless you. Father, parishioners, guests, thank you for having me here. I'm grateful for your kindness and hospitality. Uh, this century has been hard on women. In the previous century, the focus was on having it all, with people pushing for women to be able to do everything. Now, the problem is, women are expected to do everything. And we are tired. When I was growing up, one of the terrible things the world learned about life in the USSR was that the government made the women work and put their children in daycare. Now, in America, it often it's financial pressure that does the same to us. But whether a woman works outside the home for pay or simply takes on the duties of being a wife and mother, we find ourselves living in a world that does not value what we do at home, and that often leaves us few resources or time to do it. We suffer, our families suffer, and the world suffers because women civilize the world. In preparing for this talk, I thought about what a woman or thoughts woman is. A woman of prayer who tries to dress and comport herself modestly, who loves God and the people he made, who tries to serve him through clothing the naked and feeding the hungry, both in her own home and outside it. And I thought about the opposite of this, all of which is embodied in the women of the group Pussy Riot. Many of us in the Orthodox world were shocked at the way the West has embraced this group, missing the truly horrific implications of their assault on the sanctity of the church. How could this be? This has come across because the West no longer has a notion of the sacred. And one of the foremost tasks for today's Orthodox woman is to find missions and protecting the sacred places in her life and in her heart. We begin our lives on the path to salvation through baptism, which unites a person to the church. And after that, we strive to keep our souls clean through confession and constantly united with Christ through Holy Communion. And so a woman striving to make her life sacred starts the day with prayer, asking God's blessings for her and her plans and upon her family and loved ones. Matushka Yerikina Lukyamova from our Boston parish encourages me to make the sign of the cross over my children every day. Whether or not they are home, Matushka, you can make the sign of the cross over them in the air, wherever they are. We make our day sacred through the preparation of food. We prepare the things the church blesses us to eat each day. If we only cook lunch and foods on fast days, our family will fall naturally into the habit of cooking the fast. We send our family out the door with a good breakfast and armed with a good lunch, and then the chicken nuggets of the world will have less sway over them. We make our day sacred by doing good works, by being kind to others, whether we are in the workplace or at home. We choose jobs that do not harm. Many Orthodox women are nurses, teachers, doctors, and these jobs lend themselves to acts of kindness and instructing people in good habits and virtues. But in any job, you can meet your co-workers and family members warmly, keeping in mind that your smile may be the only one they receive that day. Every single day in the year is the feast of a saint, and when we read their lives and remember them, then that much of the day is already spent with the saints, with whom we wish to live forever in heaven. Some people read their daily horoscope for an aphorism on how to live that day. Would it not make more sense for us to read about the lives of the saints and to emulate their virtues? Today, for example, is Saint Anastasia the Roman, who was martyred for Christ. She was instructed in virtue by her abbess, Sophia, who taught her how to resist flattery and temptation and the temptations of the torturers. We need to resist flattery and the promise of reward for doing evil. 
They stripped her naked and whipped her, covering her with blood, and that she did not let this discourage her. Even when the world shames us, we know that God sees the truth. They cut off her hands and feet and her breasts, and she was unafraid, knowing this would save her soul, even if it cost her life. And so I prayed to her for friends facing mastectomies to save their life. When we keep in the end in mind, we can face the middle. They pulled all her teeth, and still she glorified God. They cut out her tongue, and the angels held her up, and still she did not die. Finally they beheaded her, and her soul joined our Lord in glory. The blessed Abbess Sophia found her body and buried it, just like we ought to be sure to bury the dead. From just this one life, we can take away so much. If we read, if we read the lives of the saints, we can, we'll never lack for encouragement or direction. When we work, we ask God's blessings, and we take on our task without complaining. In this way, we set a good example for our children and co-workers, and make wherever we are a place where good, goodwill and calmness prevail. Blessed are the meek, says the Gospel, but a Greek friend insists that the best translation for that word, praos, is not meek, but rather unflappable. We should strive, then, to be unflappable, so that nothing we hear in the news or read in a report card or are told in the grocery store will thrill us. We bless God and glorify Him by thanking Him for the things that He's given us and by taking care of them, and by sharing what we don't need and up what we do need with the poor. Our extra clothing goes on the backs of the needy, our extra food to the hungry, and in this way, we are the hands of Christ on this earth, truly the body of Christ. We sanctify mealtimes by remembering that every meal is also a reminder of the mystical supper. And so Russians especially teach their children not to sit on the table. We come to the table clothed, and we only discuss things that are edifying and uplifting. We end the day with prayer, handing ourselves over to God and placing ourselves under the protection of the guardian angel and the patron saint he gave us, and under the protecting veil of his mother. We sanctify the weak. We carve out time for God and we don't let anyone touch it. Saturday night is for vigil. Sunday morning is for the liturgy. If you can't come to church every week, come to church regularly at least. Write it on your calendar and don't let anyone schedule anything else for that time. Orthodox, teach, uh, Orthodox mothers teach their family how to reveal God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and this is not a groveling fear, but rather a measure of respect and awe. The West does not understand why we were so upset about the Pussy Riot attack, but contrast that, because contrast what they do with what we teach our children. We teach them to dress modestly, and these women came into church with go-go dresses. We teach our children to face the icons and never to help their backs to the iconostasis unless you have to, to bring out some pivko or to give a talk. These women danced on the top step of the altar with their backs to the altar. We don't have any sound but the human voice and the bells that call us to prayer in the church. And they blasted loud, electronic, profane music. These women claim that they did what they did to protest the state and the church. But if you want to know the proper way to get a protest against the church and state, look rather to the murdering women. Christ had been killed at the behest of Pope. At the, um, and at the time, the, myrrh, the women gathered at dawn to anoint him with myrrh, approaching a tomb that was sealed at the behest of the Roman government and guarded by the temple guards. The women worried about only one thing, how to roll away the stone. And when they got there, they saw that God had already taken care of that. The angel told them to tell the others of the resurrection of Christ, and we are charged with the same mission. The women took this charge seriously. We know they told the apostles because once every 11 weeks we hear the Latin gospel where Christ chides the apostles for not believing them. Uh, <clears throat> but they did not stop there. They went to the emperor. We have color dates for Pascha because St. Mary Magdalene went to the emperor with a poor man's gift, eggs. No one goes to the emperor empty handed. And told him that Christ was risen. He said he would believe that when the egg that she was holding had changed colors. And it did. The women disciples provided for the apostles, feeding and clothing and housing them as today's sisterhoods do for the clergy. And they did on Facebook. But it would be wrong to ignore the social media and modern technology when talking about Orthodox women. Like the telephone before it, technology can be used for evil or for good. If we use it to keep in touch with our beloved ones, to visit the sick and the lonely, to spread good thoughts and remind people of services, we are doing well. 
But we have to remember to keep our conversation chaste, not to share anything that inspires bad thoughts in others, and not to let our participation in these things keep us from having a real life. So we get in the car and visit the sick, and turn off the computer, fold the laundry. God has put us here to work out our salvation, in fear and trembling some days, and in song and rejoicing others. The burdens and troubles of the current times are also our opportunity to good, do good and to spread the gospel first through our deeds and then, if God so blesses, through our words. The opportunities and technological advances can be to our benefit if we use them wisely and can bring us down if we use them to grow further apart from those we love and therefore, in emulation of Christ, serve. In every time and every place, God loves us and gives us what we need for our salvation. I thought that was giving it before you, I still wanted to make it really short. <laughs> opportunity to ask some questions of, of Montesquieu. Um, John just asked me if that's George Lardis' wife, and it is. Yes, um, Father George Lardis was one of our first parishioners when we were still worshipping in the basement of St. Francis Church, and uh, he went to seminary, and then he met Montesquieu, and she stole him away to the East Coast. But um, nonetheless, we were still happy to invite her here, although if she asked you to take a ride in her car, you might consider where, where you could end up. But, um, so we have an opportunity for questions, so please let's let's ask some questions and we'll have a nice conversation. John. I, I was just tempted. I wanted to share something. I shared it, I think, with Father and uh, with William uh, Lamping here. But uh, I had a letter in the uh, Financial Times that was published on the Bush Lee Riot thing. Uh, pointing out that the, the hypocrisy in terms of the Western media and what it was saying about that. And if you would look up John Wilhelm and Pussy Riot, it, Riot you may uh, well find the, the text, I don't know. I think it was a good text and they did it just opposite another uh, 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 a column they had that was just spewing. Uh, uh, the, the Russian I think you may have seen that. I think somebody posted a link to it. There's a um, woman in Massachusetts who put up a page trying to explain to people what's yeah. wrong with this, and I think she put yeah. it to that. I mean, it, 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 it's appalling to me that the West doesn't understand, given everything they suffered under Soviet power, how painful something like that would be to the community. Oh, but more than that, the Christ the Savior Cathedral was rebuilt because it had been destroyed yeah. by iconoclasts. Yeah, I, I, and so it was, you know, a very real threat. And the worst thing is, the only place that would receive similar protection in the West today would be an abortion clinic. You can't go into one of those and sing and dance or do anything if they don't want you there, you know? It's just wrong. Yes? As you were delineating the, the role of the woman in our yes. in our world, what occurred to me was uh, we postmodern people were not satisfied with the fact of our God endowed equality. People are people. Yes. What we've replaced it with is this fallacy, this fallacious notion of equivocation. Um, men and women are different, and they're equal. But if yes. you use them in the wrong way, neither then, of them work. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yesterday I shared this story. I said, my husband's a wonderful father. He's just a lousy mother. And when, when, um, exactly. when exactly. I was working at a preschool and he was doing technical translations from home, our son had the chicken pox, so I left him home with him. And he wasn't sick anymore, but he still had chicken pox, so he couldn't go to school or anything. And, well, he was in preschool for a part of the day, a Mother's Day out type thing. And when I left, he was in a diaper and a t-shirt riding his bicycle around the court. And when I came home at two, he was in the, the same diaper and the same t-shirt on the same bicycle riding around the court. He had eaten. But I said, how could you let him go all day like this? He said, he didn't tell me he needed to be changed. <laughs> and men assume that everything is all right, and women assume that everything is not all right. That's why Graydon Stolpson said the most important question that a woman asks her husband, and the real question she's asking every day, whether she's asking if these pants make me look fat or if you like supper, is, do you still love me? 
And the answer has to be yes. And you have to answer that question over and over and over and over and over. And men don't get that. You know, they think they've checked that off their to-do list and they don't understand why you're so upset. It's it's one of the ways in which we're just wired differently. Could you say anything about that? You've been on this pretty incredible revelation for me. A woman needs think it's to no, hear. No, no, no. I have to tell my wife. Women are always on the lookout for things that are wrong. And men are always assuming everything's right unless somebody well, tells them you're right. <laughs> no, I, that was really, that's a yeah. really important thing. Sort of, it's quite, I tell my wife that I love her work, and we have lots of, you know, that you said yet that you would. Uh -huh. I love, we have lots of love for our just not very much. Stephen and it was not a big problem and 
Uh, the aunt was a little surprised, but she thought her sister just forgot to tell her. And the, the, the yes. Stephen's mother thought he was safe and sound at the new daycare, and so it was a surprise for everybody. But he was there, and when Father George came home, he picked up everyone, he blessed everyone, and he hugged everyone. And Stephen said, when the daddy came home, everybody kissed him, and he hugged everyone, and he hugged me. And it was just the biggest event in his four-year-old life, because his own father had died a few years back, and he just hadn't seen that. And I think it's the sort of thing a kid remembers. And it's a little thing, but it's essential. And, you know, um, it's one of the things that we just have to keep in mind. When my husband's name day is coming up, I put it on Facebook so my kids will read it and remember. Mm -hmm. Say, Lardis children, your grandmother's birthday is tomorrow, give her a call. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and some of my uncles and aunts also remember it's their mom's birthday. You know? <laughs> but, um, Technology serving. Yes, yes, yes. But then we've set the example for them that this is something you make a fuss over. And, you know, Father Gregory remembering people's name days and birthdays. That's important because it's an event and everybody should keep track of each other's milestones. When our older parishioners get together at church, they talk about how much nicer the beach was before the great hurricane of 1938. And they talk about who got punished when they misbehaved during law of God lessons when they were little and all the trouble they got into and all the good things they did together, but they remember each other's events and each other's siblings. And in that way, even if your brothers and sisters and mother and father die, if you have a parish, you still have family. That's why we stand like we do. That's why we have the men on one side and the women on the other. Somebody said, but I want to stand with my family. I said, you are. All the women in the family stand on one side and all the men in the family stand on the other. But in this way, the people who don't have relatives here still have relatives. When my daughter started college, she said, Oh, Mommy, you go to church, and you see the priest, and you see the ponytail, and you're all happy. And then he turns around to bless people, and you remember it's not Daddy. But, <laughs> but still, it's church, and it's the icons. And when you go, when your children are launched, and when you travel on business, and when you're in the wide, wide world, when you come to an Orthodox church, it's a little piece of home. And they may use different melodies, and they may use a different language, and they may have the icons in a different order, but you're home. You know which way you're supposed to stand, you know roughly what's going to happen in the service, you know more or less how to behave yourself. It's a place where the questions are already answered for you. God kisses the intent. And so, 
If we go through our lives well-intentioned, and we make a whole lot of mistakes, it's okay. God expects that, you know? Church is the one place where everybody already knows you're a wicked sinner. God already knows not only that you're going to mista make mistakes, but what mistakes you're going to make, you know? Um, I was devastated when um, I had a miscarriage very, very early in a pregnancy in 1988, and I was at church and one of the ladies was I was crying and uh, after the panihita had stopped for someone and I told her and she took me next door and they gave me wine and they gave me coffee and they told me the history of the parish and everybody who ever had a miscarriage in the parish and lived through it and got over and got stronger. And then one of them told me about her mother. Her mother was the wife of a priest who died of typhus. But before he died of typhus, he had seven children, and she had a miscarriage with the eighth, and she was dying, and they didn't have any money for the medicine that it would take to make her better. And her grandfather was a proto-priest and was a good friend of St. John of Stronsta. And the next day, from the train station, somebody came with the money for the medicine because St. John had sent it. And he had to have sent it before she needed it. God knows what we need before we know that we need it. And when you're at your lowest and you don't think there's any help from anywhere, somebody's friends with the saints, and they'll tell the saints what you need, and the saints will send it to you. And so, you know, um, anything else, sir, to let anybody get back to that coffee? Any other questions for Matushka? Thank you very much, Matushka, for coming here.